Hey, it's Mike here, and today, refined sugar. How bad is it really? We all know it's not a health food, but what's the damage? We're gonna ask a somewhat newer question of does it cause heart disease? The somewhat older question of does it make you fat? And basically, does it cause all your problems? So we're gonna look through a ton of research and even look at hacks that can help lessen the effects of sugar that does make it into your mouth, because I know you. You're sugar fiend and you're just watching this video masochistically. Also subscribers, don't forget to tap that notification bell, otherwise you you might get cavities, you know? Or, or just realistically, you wanna see my video when it comes out, notification squad knows what I'm talking about. All right, so I'm not here to make sugar look good. I'm not here to make sugar look worse than it is. I wanna get a realistic view of what damage this white refined powder's doing. Insert cocaine joke here, I'm too lazy to make one. And a very important point here, I am talking about refined sugar. I am not talking about whole sugars in whole plant foods, which do not have the negative effects that we're about to talk about. All right, let's look at some quick background, starting with the trends in sugar consumption in the USA. In 1776, when the nation was founded, we were only at four pounds per year per person of sugar. In 1950, we made it to 20 pounds. 1994, 120 pounds. And today, some estimates are as high as 160 pounds, 40 times higher than when the US started. But some estimates, like the one used in this Washington Post article, put us lower at about 100 pounds per year, and even at that amount, we eat more sugar than any other country on Earth. Merka. What does that even look like? Well, using the lower 100 pound estimate, that's about 126 grams per day. That's four Coca-Colas, 30 teaspoons of sugar, or a McDonald's shake, depending on the shake, because they range from like 50 to 160 grams of sugar. I'm loving it. Subject is now deceased due to sugar consumption. So how much should we be eating? Well, according to the American Heart Association, we should go back to how much we consumed in about 1960. And that means for women, we should only be eating 24 grams a day and for men, 36 grams a day. And that's six and nine teaspoons respectively. Well, we're eating an average of 30 to 48 teaspoons per day. Well, we just we just blew right by that one. We're eating more teaspoons than we're supposed to eat grams. Perhaps most disturbingly, the top 10% of sugar consumers in the US get 40% of their calories from refined sugar. Anyway, we need to move on now. Let's start with an area where the sugar connection is less widely known, and that is heart disease. From this study, the highest versus lowest groups of sugar intake had almost two and a half times the cardiovascular disease death, and that has a clear stepwise increase as you eat a higher percentage of total calories from sugar. And to emphasize the fact that this is a refined sugar issue, if you're looking to something like fruit, we see the opposite effect. From this study, higher fruit consumption meant a lower risk of heart disease. So please don't be afraid of whole plants. Okay, next. One might be thinking that the negative association for refined sugar might just be because refined sugar is a marker of unhealthy habits, unhealthy people have less healthy arteries and so forth, but there's actually a mechanism outlined here. And that is sugar leading to oxidation in the arteries. A huge issue is LDL or bad cholesterol oxidizing and creating inflammation and issues there, but sugar can also oxidize. And remember, oxidation is the process that leads iron to rust. And as you can see, that's pretty destructive. And from this study, the more sugar that you eat, the more oxidation you get and the more free radicals you get, which are like energy sucking bombs. They can hit the lining of the artery, suck away electrons, do some damage, have a point of damage that leads to inflammation and an immune response, which then traps all that cholesterol, creates a bit of a blockage, which can then break and lead to heart attacks and strokes. So next time you call your loved one sugar, know that you are basically calling them a murderer, or at the very least, a heartbreaker, literally. But it's worth noting that if you don't have a cholesterol problem, the risk of sugar doing damage and leading to an actual serious blockage with all that cholesterol is definitely lower. And other traditional risk factors like hypertension definitely work with this sugar to determine how much risk there actually is. And looking to vegans, you have that way lower LDL than people who eat meat, and you have that about 60% lower hypertension or high blood pressure rate, depending on the study you're looking at. And another huge point is antioxidants, the antidote to oxidation. And if you're looking at plants on average, they have about 64 times more antioxidants than animal foods, according to this study. So if you have enough antioxidants flowing through your bloodstream, you could very well prevent that oxidative stress that's caused by all that sugar in your bloodstream 
from doing any damage in the first place. So naturally, if you are going to choose a sweetener, the highest antioxidant sweetener would probably be the best. And thankfully, Nutrition Facts compiled a list of a bunch of sweeteners and their antioxidant content, and they found that date sugar was the best overall. And that's why I use date syrup as a sweetener in my e-cookbook, which you can check out if you want. Still, the best food that you can use to sweeten things would still probably be fruit. But what is the worst sweetener out there? And that brings me to agave nectar. Agave nectar has abysmally low, basically has no antioxidants at all, and fructose. And again, while well, whole food is awesome, industrial fructose has many negative effects, one of which is non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome. I mean, this study even referred to fructose as a weapon of mass destruction. And agave nectar has a higher fructose content than high fructose corn syrup. I mean, every way you look at it, agave nectar is probably the least healthy, most health wash sweetener on the planet. Moving on, we can't talk about sugar without talking about insulin and insulin resistance because insulin transports sugar and from the Mayo Clinic, quote, with insulin resistance, the body's cells don't respond normally to insulin. Glucose can't enter the cells as easily, so it builds up in the blood. So the point here is that no matter what level of sugar you're actually eating, the amount of damage that it will do will depend on how insulin resistant you are. Now for a piece of information that less people are aware of, and that is that high fat intake can also lead to insulin resistance. From this study, quote, prolonged exposure to skeletal muscle and muscle cells to high levels of fatty acids leads to severe insulin resistance. This is an issue sometimes referred to as ectopic fat, which just means fat where it's not supposed to be. This can also be intramyocellular lipids if it is fat within the muscle cell. And I talk about that a lot, but there's gonna be some new information here. There are many mechanisms that have been proposed as to why fat leads to insulin resistance. One, there's this guy named Randall. Damn it, Randall. There's also byproducts that are created within the cell, oxidative stress, of course, and even changes in gene expression. There's inflammation. Now we do eat a lot of saturated fat in the US, the main source of which is dairy. And looking to the last reason, saturated fat can actually lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. And the mitochondria is, say it with me, the powerhouse of the cell. Let me do a quick illustration of this process. Saturated fat goes in the mouth. Saturated fat eventually makes it into the cell. Free fatty acids can oxidize inside the cell. And this is what happens to your mitochondria. Not so powerful anymore. The result is insulin resistance. And okay, maybe that was a little oversimplified, but if you want a little bit more detail on the subject, you can check out Dr. Greger's video on the topic and he definitely deserves some credit for this video because a lot of the research was spotlighted by him. Naturally, we can glean some information from vegans who eat way less saturated fat and from this study, which went as far as to say that storing lipid in muscle cells may be one of the primary causes of insulin resistance. The study took a bunch of vegans and matched them with meat eaters who had the same BMI and so forth. And they found that, well, their intramyocellular lipids were the same in a couple areas. Vegans had 30% lower intramyocellular lipids in one area, which is quite a bit, all despite eating about 10% more total carbohydrates, but it's unclear whether they were refined or unrefined. And from this newer 2018 clinical trial, putting people on a vegan diet resulted in a lower level of insulin resistance. And from the Rotterdam study, quote, a higher score on the plant-based dietary index was associated with lower insulin resistance. This and some other factors come together to explain why vegans can be observed with 78% lower risk of total diabetes, which is absurdly low. All right, now let's shift the topic quite a bit all the way over to teeth. Pretty much all of us know the connection between sugar and teeth. In case you're wondering how it actually works though, from this study, quote, sugars can be readily metabolized by many bacteria involved in dentobiofilm formation, generating acid byproducts that can lead to demineralization of the tooth structure. Ouch. And a quick note about toothpaste. I've noticed that some people who go vegan or eat a more holistic diet or whatever, tend to want to avoid fluoride. And if you have any research as to why you actually should, please send it to me. But the reality is from this new mass study on the topic, their conclusion is that from a large body of controlled trials, non-fluoride toothpaste aren't shown to prevent cavities while fluoride ones are. Okay, coming back off that little tangent, speaking of large bodies, the one area where sugar gets more flack than it actually deserves, where people think it's worse than it is, is fat. There's a clear trend of blaming sugar for weight gain, but the reality is that can be observed from studies like this, is that about 90% of fat that is actually stored on the body can be traced back to fat that was eaten, that was put in the mouth, in addition to the fact that fat is over twice as calorie dense per gram 
as sugar is, it's just a no-brainer that fat's actually making people fat and they're blaming sugar. The reality is it's the refined fats and the animal fats, especially the animal fats, because looking to epidemiology like this, vegans appear to be the only group that averages in the normal BMI, not even vegetarians, and they're not eating animal fat. They even eat more carbs. All right, now let's get into some of those hacks that can mitigate or lessen the negative effects of sugar consumption. The first one, which most people probably don't know about, is vinegar. Eating vinegar with a meal that would otherwise spike your blood sugar, that can be lessened by just adding vinegar to the meal. And depending on what was eaten, you can see a blood sugar spike reduction of about 20 to 30%. How does this actually work? Well, from this study, it appears that vinegar may improve insulin action. In other words, lower insulin resistance, make insulin more effective and clear that sugar out. So vinegar might be the healthiest processed food out there. And I know I'm always talking about a whole food diet, but now I think I'm going on to a whole vinegar diet. All right, this next one might be less surprising, but it probably tastes better with dessert. And that is the berry hack, taking berries and adding them to your meals. For example, this study found that just taking straight up sucrose and then pairing it with berries, not only delayed the blood sugar spike, but also prevented a blood sugar crash afterwards, which can have its own set of negative effects that you don't want. So if you had to eat sugar, like somebody forced you to eat sugar, then eat some berries too. All right, now definitely take this next one with a grain of salt because it was paid for by the almond board. And that is what I'm just gonna call the nut hack. And that is from this study where they either gave people wonder bread and saw a blood sugar spike like this, or gave them wonder bread with almond butter and saw a less severe spike. Yes, bought and paid for, but that doesn't mean it has to be incorrect. Just a little sketchy. Now there's so many issues that are tied to sugar. We could talk about aging, we could talk about acne and so forth. In the end, I guess it's just my job to ruin all your favorite foods. But seriously, you decide yourself how much sugar you wanna eat. And it's definitely not gonna cause you any health problems to get rid of all sugar. But if you're a crazy sugar addict, maybe a good place to start is just trying to reach that daily recommended amount. You know, less sugar is gonna be better for your arteries, for your teeth. It's gonna potentially lower the inflammation in your system overall. And for vegans, yeah, it is possible that they gain a little wiggle room by having lower insulin resistance and so forth, but that should definitely not be used as an excuse to eat more sugar. I know. I know what you're thinking. And in case you haven't picked it up already, I do have my whole vegan ebook cookbook, which really minimizes sweeteners. I think only a couple of the recipes have any sweeteners in there and they're date based. And it is an ebook. So in case you forgot to buy people presents and you don't have time to ship them, you can always just click on it. All right, thanks for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. And if you're interested in this video, you might like my how heart disease is caused by high cholesterol video as well, which I'll link right there. Bam, all right, see you next time.